section seventy two of curiosities of literature volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org curiosities of literature volume two by isaac disraeli parodies a lady of bas bleu celebrity the term is getting odious particularly to our scavant had two friends whom she equally admired an elegant poet and his parodist she had contrived to prevent their meeting as long as her stratagems lasted till at length she apologized to the serious bard for inviting him when his mock umbra was to be present astonished she perceived that both men of genius felt a mutual esteem for each other's opposite talent the ridiculed had perceived no malignity in the playfulness of the parody and even seemed to consider it as a compliment aware that parodists do not waste their talent on obscure productions while the ridiculer himself was very sensible that he was the inferior poet the lady critic had imagined that parody must necessarily be malicious and in some cases it is said those on whom the parody has been performed have been of the same opinion parody strongly resembles mimicry a principle in human nature not so artificial as it appears man may be well defined a mimetic animal the african boy who amused the whole calf he journeyed with by mimicking the gestures and the voice of the auctioneer who had sold him at the slave market a few days before could have had no sense of scorn of superiority or of malignity the boy experienced merely the pleasure of repeating attitudes and intonations which had so forcibly excited his interest the numerous parodies of hamlet soliloquy were never made in derision of that solemn monologue any more than the travesties of virgil by scarron and cotton their authors were never so gaily mad as that we have parodies on the psalms by luther dodsley parodied the book of chronicles and the scripture style was parodied by franklin in his beautiful story of abraham a story he found in jeremy taylor and which taylor borrowed from the east for it is preserved in the persian sadi not one of these writers however proposed to ridicule their originals some ingenuity in the application was all they intended the lady critic alluded to had suffered by a panic in imagining that a parody was necessarily a corrosive satire had she indeed proceeded one step farther and asserted that parodies might be classed among the most malicious inventions in literature when they are such as coleman and lloyd made on gray in their odes to oblivion and obscurity her reading possibly might have supplied the materials of the present research parodies were frequently practised by the ancients and with them like ourselves consisted of a work grafted on another work but which turned on a different subject by a slight change of the expressions it might be a sport of fancy the innocent child of mirth or a satirical arrow drawn from the quiver of caustic criticism or it was that malignant art which only studies to make the original of the parody however beautiful contemptible and ridiculous human nature thus enters into the composition of parodies and their variable character originates in the purpose of their application there is in the million a natural taste for farce after tragedy and they gladly relieve themselves by mitigating the solemn seriousness of the tragic drama for they find that it is but a step from the sublime to the ridiculous the taste for parody will i fear always prevail for whatever tends to ridicule a work of genius is usually very agreeable to a great number of contemporaries in the history of parodies some of the learned 
have noticed a superstitious circumstance which however may have happened for it is a very natural one when the rhapsodists who strolled from town to town to chant different fragments of the poems of homer had recited they were immediately followed by another set of strollers buffoons who made the same audience merry by the burlesque turn which they gave to the solemn strains which had just so deeply engaged their attention it is supposed that we have one of these travestiers of the iliad in one sotates who succeeded by only changing the measure of the verses without altering the words which entirely disguised the homeric character fragments of which scattered in dionysius halicarnassensis i leave to the curiosity of the learned grecian footnote henry stephen appears first to have started this subject of parody his researches have been borrowed by the abbe salier to whom in my turn i am occasionally indebted his little dissertation is in the french academy's memoirs tome seven three hundred ninety eight end of footnote homer's battle of the frogs and mice a learned critic the elder heinsius asserts was not written by the poet but is a parody on the poem it is evidently as good-humoured and one as any in the rejected addresses and it was because homer was the most popular poet that he was most susceptible of the playful honours of the parodist unless the prototype is familiar to us a parody is nothing of these parodists of homer we may regret the loss of one time and aphilius whose parodies were termed silly from silenus being their chief personage he levelled them at the sophistical philosophers of his age his invocation is grafted on the opening of the iliad to recount the evil doings of those babblers whom he compares to the bags in which aeolus deposited all his winds balloons inflated with empty ideas we should like to have appropriated some of these silly or parodies of time in the syllograph which however seem to have been at times calumnious footnote see a specimen in aulus gellius where this parodist reproaches plato for having given a high price for a book whence he drew his noble dialogue of the timaeus book three canto seventeen end of footnote shenstone's school mistress and some few other ludicrous poems derive much of their merit from parody this taste for parodies was very prevalent with the grecians and is a species of humour which perhaps has been too rarely practised by the moderns cervantes has some passages of this nature in his parodies of the old chivalric romances fielding in some parts of his tom jones and joseph andrews in his burlesque poetical descriptions and swift in his battle of books and tale of a tub but few writers have equalled the delicacy and felicity of pope's parodies in the rape of the lock such parodies give refinement to burlesque the ancients made a liberal use of it in their satirical comedy and sometimes carried it on through an entire work as in the menippean satire seneca's mock eloge of claudius and lucian in his dialogues there are parodies even in plato and an anecdotical one recorded of this philosopher shows them in their most simple state dissatisfied with his own poetical essays he threw them into the flames that is the sage resolved to sacrifice his verses to the god of fire and in repeating that line in homer where thetis addresses vulcan to implore his aid the application became a parody although it required no other change than the insertion of the philosopher's name instead of the goddesses vulcan arise tis plato claims thy aid footnote see spanheim les Césars de l'empereur julien in his preuve remark eight salier judiciously observes il peut nous donner une juste idée de cette sorte d'ouvrage mais nous ne savons pas précisément en quel 
thème il a été composé no more truly than the iliad itself End of footnote. boileau affords a happy instance of this simple parody Cornille, in his cid makes one of his personages remark pour grand que soit les oies ils sont ce que nous sommes ils peuvent se tromper comme les autres hommes a slight alteration became a fine parody in boyau's chapelain des coiffes pour grand que soit les rois ils sont ce que nous sommes ou fait trompant envers comme les autres hommes we find in athenaeus the name of the inventor of a species of parody which more immediately engages our notice dramatic parodies it appears this inventor was a satirist so that the lady critic whose opinion we had the honour of noticing would be warranted by appealing to its origin to determine the nature of the thing a dramatic parody which produced the greatest effect was the gigantomachia as appears by the only circumstance known of it never laughed the athenians so heartily as at its representation for the fatal news of the deplorable state to which the affairs of the republic were reduced in sicily arrived at its first representation and the athenians continued laughing to the end as the modern athenians the volatile parisians might in their national concern of an opera comique it was the business of the dramatic parody to turn the solemn tragedy which the audience had just seen exhibited into a farcical comedy the same actors who had appeared in magnificent dresses now returned on the stage in grotesque habiliments with odd postures and gestures while the story though the same was incongruous and ludicrous the cyclops of euripides is probably the only remaining specimen for this may be considered as a parody on the ninth book of the odyssey the adventures of ulysses in the cave of polyphemus where silenus and a chorus of satyrs are farcically introduced to contrast with the grave narrative of homer of the shifts and escape of the cunning man from the one-eyed ogre the jokes are too coarse for the french taste of brumois who in his translation goes on with a critical growl and foolish apology for euripides having written a farce brumois like pistol is forced to eat his onion but with a worse grace swallowing and execrating to the end in dramatic composition aristophanes is perpetually hooking in parodies of euripides whom of all poets he hated as well as of aeschylus sophocles and other tragic bards since at length that grecian wit has found a translator saturated with his genius and an interpreter as philosophical the subject of grecian parody will probably be reflected in a clearer light from his researches dramatic parodies in modern literature were introduced by our vivacious neighbours and may be said to constitute a class of literary satires peculiar to the french nation what had occurred in greece a similar gaiety of national genius unconsciously reproduced the dramatic parodies in our own literature as in the rehearsal tom thumb footnote the first edition of this play is a solemn parody throughout in the preface the author defends it from being as maliciously reported a burlesque on the loftiest parts of tragedy and designed to banish what we generally call fine writing from the stage when he afterwards quotes parallel passages from popular plays which he has parodied he does so saying whether this sameness of thought and expression which i have quoted from them proceeded from an agreement in their way of thinking or whether they have borrowed from our author i leave the reader to determine End of footnote. and the critic however exquisite are confined to particular passages and are not grafted on a whole original we have neither naturalized the dramatic parody into a species nor dedicated to it the honours of a separate theatre this peculiar dramatic satire a burlesque of an entire tragedy 
the volatile genius of the parisians accomplished whenever a new tragedy which still continues the favoured species of drama with the french attracted the notice of the town shortly after uprose its parody at the italian theatre so that both pieces may have been performed in immediate succession in the same evening a french tragedy is most susceptible of this sort of ridicule by applying its declamatory style its exaggerated sentiments and its romantic out-of-the-way nature to the commonplace incidents and persons of domestic life out of the stuff of which they made their emperors their heroes and their princesses they cut out a pompous country justice a hectoring tailor or an impudent mantua maker but it was not merely this travesty of great personages nor the lofty effusions of one in a lowly station which terminated the object of parody it was designed for a higher object that of more obviously exposing the original for any absurdity in its scenes or in its catastrophe and dissecting its faulty characters in a word weighing in the critical scales the nonsense of the poet parody sometimes became a refined instructor for the public whose discernment is often blinded by party or prejudice but it was too a severe touchstone for genius racine some say smiled others say he did not when he witnessed harlequin in the language of titus to berenice declaiming on some ludicrous affair to columbine la motte was very sore and voltaire and others shrunk away with a cry from a parody voltaire was angry when he witnessed his mariamne parodied by le mauvais menage or bad housekeeping the aged jealous herod was turned into an old cross country justice varou bewitched by mariamne strutted a dragoon and the whole establishment showed it was under very bad management fuselier collected some of these parodies and not unskilfully defends their nature and their object against the protest of la motte whose tragedies had severely suffered from these burlesques his celebrated domestic tragedy of inez de castro the fable of which turns on a concealed and clandestine marriage produced one of the happiest parodies in agnes de chaillot in the parody the cause of the mysterious obstinacy of pierrot the son in persisting to refuse the hand of the daughter of his mother-in-law madame la baillive is thus discovered by her to monsieur le baillif mon mari pour le coup j'ai découvert l'affaire ne vous étonnez plus qu'à nos désirs contraires pour ma fille pierrot ne montre que mépris voilà l'unique objet dont son cœur est épris pointing to agnes de chaillot the bailiff exclaims ma servant this single word was the most lively and fatal criticism of the tragic action of inez de castro which according to the conventional decorum and fastidious code of french criticism grossly violated the majesty of malpomene by giving a motive and an object so totally undignified to the tragic tale in the parody there was something ludicrous when the secret came out which explained poor pierrot's long concealed perplexities in the maid-servant bringing forward a whole legitimate family of her own la motte was also galled by a projected parody of his machabees where the hasty marriage of the young machabeus and the sudden conversion of the amorous antigone who for her first penitential act persuades a youth to marry her without first deigning to consult her respectable mother would have produced an excellent scene for the parody but la motte prefixed an angry preface to his inez de castro he inveighs against all parodies which he asserts to be merely a french fashion we have seen however that it was once grecian the offspring of a dangerous spirit of ridicule and the malicious amusement of superficial minds were this true retorts fuselier 
we ought to detest parodies but we maintain that far from converting virtue into a paradox and degrading truth by ridicule parody will only strike at what is chimerical and false it is not a piece of buffoonery so much as a critical exposition what do we parody but the absurdities of dramatic writers who frequently make their heroes act against nature common sense and truth after all he ingeniously adds it is the public not we who are the authors of these parodies for they are usually but the echoes of the pit and we parodists have only to give a dramatic form to the opinions and observations we hear many tragedies fusilier with admirable truth observes disguise vices into virtues and parodies unmask them we have had tragedies recently which very much required parodies to expose them and to shame our inconsiderate audiences who patronize these monsters of false passions the rants and bombast of some of these might have produced with little or no alteration of the inflated originals a modern rehearsal or a new tragedy for warm weather footnote the tailors a tragedy for warm weather was originally brought out by foot in seventeen sixty seven there had been great disturbances between the master tailors and journeymen about wages at this time and the author has amusingly worked out the disputes and their consequences in the heroic style of a blank verse tragedy End of footnote of parodies we may safely approve the legitimate use and even indulge their agreeable maliciousness while we must still dread that extraordinary facility to which the public or rather human nature is so prone as sometimes to laugh at what at another time they would shed tears tragedy is rendered comic or burlesque by altering the station and manners of the persons and the reverse may occur of raising what is comic or burlesque into tragedy on so little depends the sublime or the ridiculous beattie says in most human characters there are blemishes moral intellectual or corporeal by exaggerating which to a certain degree you may form a comic character as by raising the virtues abilities or external advantages of individuals you form epic or tragic characters a subject humorously touched on by lloyd in the prologue to the jealous wife quarrels upbraidings jealousies and spleen grow too familiar in the comic scene tinge but the language with heroic chime tis passion pathos character sublime what big round words had swelled the pompous scene a king the husband and the wife a queen End of section 72section 73 of curiosities of literature volume 2 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org curiosities of literature volume 2 by isaac disraeli anecdotes of the fairfax family will a mind of great capacity be reduced to mediocrity by the ill choice of a profession parents are interested in the metaphysical discussion whether there really exists an inherent quality in the human intellect which imparts to the individual an aptitude for one pursuit more than for another what lord shaftesbury calls not innate but connatural qualities of the human character were during the latter part of the last century entirely rejected but of late there appears a tendency to return to the notion which is consecrated by antiquity experience will often correct modern hypothesis the term predisposition may be objectionable as are all terms which pretend to describe the occult operations of nature and at present we have no other 
our children pass through the same public education while they are receiving little or none for their individual dispositions should they have sufficient strength of character to indicate any the great secret of education is to develop the faculties of the individual for it may happen that his real talent may lie hidden and buried under his education a profession is usually adventitious made by chance views or by family arrangements should a choice be submitted to the youth himself he will often mistake slight and transient tastes for permanent dispositions a decided character however we may often observe is repugnant to a particular pursuit delighting in another talents languid and vacillating in one profession we might find vigorous and settled in another an indifferent lawyer might become an admirable architect at present all our human bullion is sent to be melted down in an university to come out as if thrown into a burning mould a bright physician a bright lawyer a bright divine in other words to adapt themselves for a profession preconcerted by their parents by this means we may secure a titular profession for our son but the true genius of the avocation in the bent of the mind as a man of great original powers called it is too often absent instead of finding fit offices for fit men we are perpetually discovering on the stage of society actors out of character our most popular writer has happily described this error a laughing philosopher the democritus of our day once compared human life to a table pierced with a number of holes each of which has a pin made exactly to fit it but which pins being stuck in hastily and without selection chance leads inevitably to the most awkward mistakes for how often do we see the orator pathetically concluded how often i say do we see the round man stuck into the three-cornered hole in looking over a manuscript life of toby matthews archbishop of york in james the first reign i found a curious anecdote of his grace's disappointment in the dispositions of his sons the cause indeed is not uncommon as was confirmed by another great man to whom the archbishop confessed it the old lord thomas fairfax one day finding the archbishop very melancholy inquired the reason of his grace's pensiveness my lord said the archbishop i have great reason of sorrow with respect of my sons one of whom has wit and no grace another grace but no wit and the third neither grace nor wit your case replied lord fairfax is not singular i am also sadly disappointed in my sons one i sent into the netherlands to train him up a soldier and he makes a tolerable country justice but a mere coward at fighting my next i sent to cambridge and he proves a good lawyer but a mere dunce at divinity and my youngest i sent to the inns of court and he is good at divinity but nobody at the law the relator of this anecdote adds this i have often heard from the descendant of that honourable family who yet seems to mince the matter because so immediately related the eldest son was the lord ferdinando fairfax and the gunsmith to thomas lord fairfax the son of this lord ferdinando heard the old lord thomas call aloud to his grandson tom tom mind thou the battle thy father's a good man but a mere coward all the good i expect is from thee it is evident that the old lord thomas fairfax was a military character and in his earnest desire of continuing a line of heroes had preconcerted to make his eldest son a military man who we discover turned out to be admirably fitted for a worshipful justice of the quorum this is a lesson for the parent who consults his own inclinations and not those of natural disposition in the present case the same lord though disappointed appears still to have persisted in the same wish of having a great military character in his family having missed one in his elder son and settled his other sons in different avocations the grandfather 
persevered and fixed his hopes and bestowed his encouragements on his grandson sir thomas fairfax who makes so distinguished a figure in the civil wars the difficulty of discerning the aptitude of a youth for any particular destination in life will perhaps even for the most skilful parent be always hazardous many will be inclined in despair of anything better to throw dice with fortune or adopt the determination of the father who settled his sons by a whimsical analogy which he appears to have formed of their dispositions or aptness for different pursuits the boys were standing under a hedge in the rain and a neighbour reported to the father the conversation he had overheard john wished it would rain books for he wished to be a preacher bezaleel wool to be a clothier like his father samuel money to be a merchant and edmund plums to be a grocer the father took these wishes as a hint and we are told in the life of john angier the elder son a puritan minister that he chose for them these different callings in which it appears that they settled successfully whatever a young man at first applies himself to is commonly his delight afterwards this is an important principle discovered by hartley but it will not supply the parent with any determinate regulation how to distinguish a transient from a permanent disposition or how to get at what we may call the conatural qualities of the mind a particular opportunity afforded me some close observation on the characters and habits of two youths brothers in blood and affection and partners in all things who even to their very dress shared alike who were never separated from each other who were taught by the same masters lived under the same roof and were accustomed to the same uninterrupted habits yet had nature created them totally distinct in the qualities of their minds and similar as their lives had been their abilities were adapted for very opposite pursuits either of them could not have been the other and i observed how the predisposition of the parties was distinctly marked from childhood the one slow penetrating and correct the other quick irritable and fanciful the one persevering in examination the other rapid in results the one exhausted by labour the other impatient of whatever did not relate to his own pursuit the one logical historical and critical the other having acquired nothing decided on all things by his own sensations we would confidently consult in the one a great legal character and the other an artist of genius if nature had not secretly placed a bias in their distinct minds how could two similar beings have been so dissimilar a story recorded of cecco d'ascoli and of dante on the subject of natural and acquired genius may illustrate the present topic cecco maintained that nature was more potent than art while dante asserted the contrary to prove his principle the great italian bard referred to his cat which by repeated practice he had taught to hold a candle in its paw while he supped or read cecco desired to witness the experiment and came not unprepared for his purpose when dante's cat was performing its part cecco lifting up the lid of a pot which he had filled with mice the creature of art instantly showed the weakness of a talent merely acquired and dropping the candle flew on the mice with all its instinctive propensity dante was himself disconcerted and it was adjudged that the advocate for the occult principle of native faculties had gained his cause to tell stories however is not to lay down principles yet principles may sometimes be concealed in stories footnote i have arranged many facts connected with the present subject in the fifth chapter of the literary character in the enlarged and fourth edition eighteen twenty eight end of footnote End of section 73section 74 of curiosities of literature volume 2 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org 
Recording by Greg Giordano Curiosities of Literature Volume 2 by Isaac Desraeli Medicine and Morals A stroke of personal ridicule is leveled at Dryden when Bayes informs us of his preparations for a course of study by a course of medicine. Quote, when I have found a grand design, says he, I ever take psychic and let blood. For when you would have pure swiftness of thought and fiery flights of fancy, you must have a care of the pensive part. In fine, you must purge the belly. End quote. Such was really the practice of the poet, as Le Mont, who was a physician, informs us, and in his medical character did not perceive that ridicule in the subject which the wits and most readers unquestionably have enjoyed. The wits here were as cruel against truth as against Dryden, for we must still consider this practice, to use their own words, as an excellent recipe for writing among other philosophers one of the most famous disputants of antiquity camedes was accustomed to take copious doses of white hellebore a great aperient as a preparation to refute the dogmas of the stoics Quote, the thing that gives me the highest spirits it seems absurd but true is a dose of salts but one can't take them like champagne End quote said lord byron dryden's practice was neither whimsical nor peculiar to the poet he was of a full habit and no doubt had often found by experience the beneficial effects without being aware of the cause which is nothing less than the reciprocal influence of mind and body this simple fact is indeed connected with one of the most important inquiries in the history of man the laws which regulate the invisible union of the soul with the body in a word the inscrutable mystery of our being a secret but an undoubted intercourse which probably must ever elude our perceptions the combination of metaphysics with physics has only been productive of the wildest fairy tales among philosophers with one party the soul seems to pass away in its last puff of air a man seems to perish in quote, dust to dust end quote. the other as successfully gets rid of our bodies altogether by denying the existence of matter we are not certain that mind and matter are distinct existences since the one may be only a modification of the other however this great mystery be imagined we shall find with dr gregory in his lectures quote, on the duties and qualifications of a physician end quote, that it forms an equally necessary inquiry in the sciences of morals and medicine whether we consider the vulgar distinction of mind and body as an union or as a modified existence the philosopher denies that a reciprocal action takes place between our moral and physical condition of these sympathies like many other mysteries of nature the cause remains occult while the effects are obvious this close yet inscrutable association this concealed correspondence of parts seemingly unconnected in a word this reciprocal influence of the mind and the body has long fixed the attention of medical and metaphysical inquirers the one having the care of our exterior organization the other that of the interior can we conceive the mysterious inhabitant as forming a part of its own inhabitation the tenant and the house are so inseparable that in striking at any part of the dwelling you inevitably reach the dweller if the mind be disordered we may often look for its seat in some corporeal derangement often are our thoughts disturbed by a strange irritability which we do not even pretend to account for the state of the body called the fidgets is a disorder to which the ladies are particularly liable a physician of my acquaintance was earnestly entreated by a female patient to give a name to her unknown complaints this he found no difficulty to do 
as he is a sturdy searcher of the materiality of our nature he declared that her disorder was atmospherical it was the disorder of her frame under damp weather which was reacting on her mind and physical means by operating on her body might be applied to restore her to her half-lost senses our imagination is higher when our stomach is not overloaded in spring than in winter in solitude than amidst company and in an obscured light than in the blaze and heat of the noon in all these cases the body is evidently acted on and reacts on the mind sometimes our dreams present us with images of our restlessness till we recollect that the seat of our brain may perhaps lie in our stomach rather than on the pineal gland of descartes and that the most artificial logic to make us somewhat reasonable may be swallowed with the blue pill our domestic happiness often depends on the state of our biliary and digestive organs and the little disturbances of conjugal life may be more efficaciously cured by the physician than by the moralist for a sermon misapplied will never act so directly as a sharp medicine the learned gabius an eminent professor of medicine at leyden who called himself quote, professor of the passions end quote, gives the case of a lady of too inflammable a constitution whom her husband unknown to herself had gradually reduced to a model of decorum by phlebotomy her complexion indeed lost the roses which some perhaps had too wantonly admired for the repose of her conjugal physician the art of curing moral disorders by corporeal means has not yet been brought into general practice although it is probable that some quiet sages of medicine have made use of it on some occasions the leyden professor we have just alluded to delivered at the university a discourse quote, on the management and care of the disorders of the mind by application to the body end quote. descartes conjectured that as the mind seems so dependent on the disposition of the bodily organs if any means can be found to render men wiser and more ingenious than they have been hitherto such a method might be sought from the assistance of medicine the sciences of morals and of medicine will therefore be found to have a more intimate connection than has been suspected plato thought that a man must have natural dispositions towards virtue to become virtuous that it cannot be educated you cannot make a bad man a good man which he ascribes to the evil dispositions of the body as well as to a bad education there are unquestionably constitutional moral disorders some good-tempered but passionate persons have acknowledged that they cannot avoid those temporary fits to which they are liable and which they say they always suffered quote, from a child end quote. if they arise from too great a fullness of blood is it not cruel to abrade rather than to cure them which might easily be done by taking away their redundant humours and thus quieting the most passionate man alive a moral patient who allows his brain to be disordered by the fumes of liquor instead of being suffered to be a ridiculous being might have opiates prescribed for in laying him asleep as soon as possible ye remove the cause of his sudden madness there are crimes for which men are hanged but of which they might easily have been cured by physical means persons out of their senses with love by throwing themselves into a river and being dragged out nearly lifeless have recovered their senses and lost their bewildering passion submersion is discovered to be a cure for some mental disorders by altering the state of the body as van helmont notices quote, was happily practised in england end quote. with the circumstance to which the sage of chemistry alludes i am unacquainted but this extraordinary practice was certainly known to the italians for in one of the tales of the poggio we find a mad doctor of milan who was celebrated for curing lunatics and demoniacs in a certain time his practice consisted in placing them in a great high-walled courtyard in the midst of which there was a deep well full of water cold as ice when a demoniac was brought to this physician he had the patient bound to a pillar in the well 
till the water ascended to the knees or higher and even to the neck as he deemed their malady required in their bodily pain they appeared to have forgot their melancholy thus by the terrors of the repetition of cold water a man appears to have been frightened into his senses a physician has informed me of a remarkable case a lady with a disordered mind resolved on death and swallowed much more than half a pint of laudanum she closed her curtains in the evening took a farewell of her attendants and flattered herself she would never awaken from her sleep in the morning however notwithstanding this incredible dose she awoke in the agonies of death by the usual means she was enabled to get rid of the poison she had so largely taken and not only recovered her life but what is more extraordinary her perfect senses the physician conjectures that it was the influence of her disordered mind over her body which prevented this vast quantity of laudanum from its usual action by terminating in death footnote a physician of eminence has told us of the melancholy termination of the life of a gentleman who in a state of mental aberration cut his throat loss of blood restored his mind to a healthy condition but the wound unfortunately proved fatal End of footnote. moral vices or infirmities which originate in the state of the body may be cured by topical applications precepts and ethics in such cases if they seem to produce a momentary cure have only moved the weeds whose roots lie in the soil it is only by changing the soil itself that we can eradicate these evils the senses are five porches for the physician to enter into the mind to keep it in repair by altering the state of the body we are changing that of the mind and whenever the defects of the mind depend on those of the organization the mind or soul however distinct its being from the body is disturbed or excited independent of its volition by the mechanical impulses of the body a man becomes stupefied when the circulation of the blood is impeded in the viscera he acts more from instinct than reflection the nervous fibres are too relaxed or too tense and he finds a difficulty in moving them if you heighten his sensations you awaken new ideas in the stupid being and as we cure the stupid by increasing his sensibility we may believe that a more vivacious fancy may be promised to those who possess one when the mind and the body play together in one harmonious accord prescribe the bath frictions and fomentations and though it seems a roundabout way you get at the brains by his feet a literary man from long sedentary habits could not overcome his fits of melancholy till his physician doubled his daily quantity of wine and the learned henry stevens after a severe aug had such a disgust of books the most beloved objects of his whole life that the very thought of them excited terror for a considerable time it is evident that the state of the body often indicates that of the mind insanity itself often results from some disorder in the human machine Quote, what is this mind in which men appear so vain exclaims fleischer if considered according to its nature it is a fire which sickness and an accident most sensibly puts out it is a delicate temperament which soon grows disordered a happy conformation of organs which wear out a combination and a certain motion of the spirits which exhaust themselves it is the most lively and the most subtle part of the soul which seems to grow old with the body End quote. It is not wonderful that some have attributed such virtues to their system of diet, if it has been found productive of certain effects on the human body. Cornaro perhaps imagined more than he experienced, but Apollonius Tyanius, when he had the credit of holding an intercourse with the devil by his presumed gift of prophecy, defended himself from the accusation by attributing his clear and prescient views of things to the light ailments he lived on never indulging in a variety of food quote, this mode of life has produced such a perspicuity in my ideas that i see as in a glass things past and future 
we may therefore agree with bayes that quote, for a sonnet to amanda and the like stewed prunes only end quote, might be sufficient but for a grand design nothing less than a more formal and formidable dose camus a french physician who combined literature with science the author of abdecker or the art of cosmetics which he discovered in exercise and temperance produced another fanciful work written in seventeen fifty three la medicine de l'esprit his conjectural cases are at least as numerous as his more positive facts for he is not wanting in imagination he assures us that having reflected on the physical causes which by differently modifying the body varied also the dispositions of the mind he was convinced that by employing these different causes or by imitating their powers by art we might by means purely mechanical affect the human mind and correct the infirmities of the understanding and the will he considered this principle only as the aurora of a brighter day the great difficulty to overcome was to find out a method to root out the defects or the diseases of the soul in the same manner as physicians cure a fluxion from the lungs a dysentery a dropsy and all other infirmities which seem only to attack the body this indeed he says is enlarging the domain of medicine by showing how the functions of intellect and the springs of volition are mechanical the movements and passions of the soul formerly restricted to abstract reasonings are by this system reduced to simple ideas insisting that material causes force the soul and body to act together the defects of the intellectual operations depend on those of the organization which may be altered or destroyed by physical causes and he properly adds that we are to consider that the soul is material while existing in matter because it is operated on by matter such is the theory of la medicine de l'esprit which though physicians will never quote may perhaps contain some facts worth their attention camus two little volumes seem to have been preceded by a medical discourse delivered in the academy of dijon in seventeen forty eight where the moralist compares the infirmities and vices of the mind to parallel diseases of the body we may safely consider some infirmities and passions of the mind as diseases and could they be treated as we do the bodily ones to which they bear an infinity this would be the great triumph of morals and medicine the passion of avarice resembles the thirst of dropsical patients that of envy is a slow wasting fever love is often frenzy and capricious and sudden restlessness epileptic fits there are moral disorders which at times spread like epidemical maladies through towns and countries and even nations there are hereditary vices and infirmities transmitted from the parent's mind as there are unquestionably such diseases of the body the son of a father of a hot and irritable temperament inherits the same quickness and warmth a daughter is often the counterpart of her mother morality could it be treated medicinally would require its prescriptions as all diseases have their specific remedies the great secret is perhaps discovered by camus that of operating on the mind by means of the body a recent writer seems to have been struck by these curious analogies mr haslam in his work on sound mind says page ninety quote, there seems to be a considerable similarity between the morbid state of the instruments of voluntary motion that is the body and certain affections of the mental powers that is the mind thus paralysis has its counterpart in the defects of recollection where the utmost endeavor to remember is ineffectually exerted tremor may be compared with incapability of fixing the attention and this involuntary state of muscles ordinarily subjected to the will also finds a parallel where the mind loses its influence in the train of thought and becomes subject to spontaneous intrusions as may be exemplified in reveries dreaming and some species of madness End quote. thus one philosopher discovers the analogies of the mind with the body and another of the body with the mind 
can we now hesitate to believe that such analogies exist and advancing one step farther trace in this reciprocal influence that a part of the soul is the body as the body becomes a part of the soul the most important truth remains undivulged and never will in this mental pharmacy but none is more clear than that which led to the view of this subject that in this mutual intercourse of body and mind the superior is often governed by the inferior others think the mind is more willfully outrageous than the body plutarch in his essays has a familiar illustration which he borrows from some philosopher more ancient than himself Quote, should the body sue the mind before a court of judicature for damages it would be found the mind would prove to have been a ruinous tenant to its landlord End quote. the sage of Chironia did not foresee the hint of descartes in the discovery of camus that by medicine we may alleviate or remove the diseases of the mind a practice which indeed has not yet been pursued by physicians though the moralists have been often struck by the close analogies of the mind with the body a work by the learned dom pernetti la cunoisse de l'âme morale parcelle de l'âme physique we are told is more fortunate in its title than its execution probably it is one of the many attempts to develop this imperfect and obscure truth which hereafter may become more obvious and be universally comprehended End of section seventy four recording by Greg Giordano, Newport Ritchie, Florida. Section seventy five of Curiosities of Literature, Volume two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sonia curiosities of literature volume two by isaac disraeli psalm singing the history of psalm singing is a portion of the history of reformation of that great religious revolution which separated forever into two unequal divisions the establishment of christianity it has not perhaps been remarked that psalm singing or metrical psalms degenerated into those scandalous compositions which under the abused title of hymns are now used by some sects footnote it would be polluting these pages with ribaldry obscenity and blasphemy were i to give specimens of some hymns of the moravians and the methodists and some of the still lower sects End of footnote. these are evidently the last disorders of that system of psalm singing which made some religious persons early oppose its practice even sternhold and hopkins our first psalm inditers says honest fuller found their work afterwards met with some frowns in the faces of great clergymen to this day these opinions are not adjusted archbishop secker observes that though the first christians from this passage in james verse thirteen is any merry let him sing psalms made singing a constant part of their worship and the whole congregation joined in it yet afterwards the singers by profession who had been prudently appointed to lead and direct them by degrees usurped the whole performance but at the reformation the people were restored to their rights this revolutionary style is singular one might infer by the expression of the people being restored to their rights that a mixed assembly roaring out confused tunes nasal guttural and sibilant was a more orderly government of psalmody than when the executive power was consigned to the voices of those whom the archbishop had justly described as having been first prudently appointed to lead and direct them and who by their subsequent proceedings evidently discovered what they might have safely conjectured that such a universal suffrage where every man was to have a voice must necessarily end in clatter and chaos Footnote there is a rare tract entitled singing of psalmers vindicated from the charge of novelty in answer to dr russell mr marlow etc sixteen ninety eight it furnishes numerous authorities to show that it was practised by the primitive christians on almost every occasion i shall directly quote a remarkable passage 
End of footnote. Thomas Wharton, however, regards the metrical psalms of Sternhold as a puritanic invention, and asserts that, notwithstanding it is said in their title page that they are set forth and allowed to be sung in all churches, they were never admitted by lawful authority. They were first introduced by the Puritans, from the Calvinists of Geneva, and afterwards continued by connivance. As a true poetical antiquary, Thomas Wharton condemns any modernization of the venerable text of the old Sternhold and Hopkins, which, by changing obsolete for familiar words, destroys the texture of the original style, and many stanzas, already too naked and weak, like a plain old Gothic edifice stripped of its few signatures of antiquity, have lost that little and almost only strength and support which they derive from ancient phrases. Such alterations, even if executed with prudence and judgment, only corrupt what they endeavour to explain, and exhibit a motley performance, belonging to no character of writing, and which contains more improprieties than those which it professes to remove. This forcible criticism is worthy of our poetical antiquary. The same feeling was experienced by Pasquier, when Marot, in his Rifacciamento of the Roman de la Rose, left some of the obsolete phrases, while he got rid of others. Cette bigarrure de langage vieux et moderne was with him writing no language at all. The same circumstance occurred abroad, when they resolved to retouch and modernize the old French metrical version of the Psalms, which we are about to notice. It produced the same controversy and the same dissatisfaction. The Church of Geneva adopted an improved version, but the charm of the old one was wanting. To trace the history of modern medical psalmody, we must have recourse to Bale, who as a mere literary historian has accidentally preserved it. The inventor was a celebrated French poet, and the invention, though perhaps in its very origin inclining towards the abuse to which it was afterwards carried, was unexpectedly adopted by the austere Calvin, and introduced into the Geneva discipline. It is indeed strange that while he was stripping religion not merely of its pageantry, but even of its decent ceremonies, this levelling reformer should have introduced this taste for singing psalms in opposition to reading psalms. On a parallel principle, says Thomas Wharton, and if any artificial aids to devotion were to be allowed, he might at least have retained the use of pictures in the church. But it was decreed that statues should be mutilated of their fair proportions, and painted glass be dashed into pieces, while the congregation were to sing. Calvin sought for proselytes among the rebel of a republic who can have no relish for the more elegant externals. But to have made men sing in concert, in the streets or at their work, and merry or sad on all occasions to tickle the ear with rhymes and touch the heart with emotion, was betraying no deficient knowledge of human nature. It seems, however, that this project was adopted accidentally, and was certainly promoted by the fine natural genius of Clément Marot, the favoured bard of Francis I, that prince of poets and that poet of princes, as he was quaintly but expressively dignified by his contemporaries. Marot is still an inimitable and true poet, for he has written in a manner of his own with such marked felicity that he has left his name to a style of poetry called Marotique. The original La Fontaine is his imitator. Marot delighted in the very forms of poetry, as well as its subjects and its manner. His life indeed took more shapes and indulged in more poetical licenses than even his poetry. Licentious in morals, often in prison or at court, or in the army, or a fugitive, he has left in his numerous little poems many a curious record of his variegated existence. He was indeed very far from being devout, when his friend, the learned Vatable, the Hebrew professor, probably to reclaim a perpetual sinner from profane rhymes, as Marot was suspected of heresy, confession and meagre days being his abhorrence, suggested the new project of translating the psalms into French verse and no doubt assisted the bard, traduit son rythme français, selon la vérité hébraïque. The famous Théodore Béza was also his friend and prompter, and afterwards his continuator. Marot published fifty-two psalms, written in a variety of measures, with the same style he had done his ballads and rondeaux. He dedicated his work to the King of France, comparing him with the royal Hebrew and with a French compliment. Dieu le donna au peuple hébraïque, Dieu te devoir, ce pensage au Gallique. 
he insinuates that in his version he had received assistance par les divins esprits qui en sous toi ébrieux langage a pris nous sont jetés les psaumes en lumière claire et au sens de la forme première this royal dedication is more solemn than usual yet marot who was never grave but in prison soon recovered from this dedication to the king for on turning the leaf we find another aux dames de france wharton says of marot that he seems anxious to deprecate the raillery which the new tone of his versification was likely to incur and is embarrassed to find an apology for turning saint his embarrassments however terminate in a highly poetical fancy when will the golden age be restored exclaims this lady's psalmists quand n'auront plus de cour ni lieu les chansons de ce petit dieu à qui les peintres font des ailes ô oh, vous dames et demoiselles que dieu fait pour être son temple et faites sous mauvais exemple retentir et chambre et salle de chansons mondaines ou sales etc knowing continues the poet that songs that are silent about love can never please you here are some composed by love itself all here is love but more than mortal sing these at all times et les convertir et muer faisant vos lèvres remuer et vos doigts sur les espinettes pour dire sainte chansonnette marot then breaks forth with that enthusiasm which perhaps at first conveyed to the sullen fancy of the austere calvin the project he so successfully adopted and whose influence we are still witnessing ô bienheureux qui voir pourra fleurir le temps que l'on aura le laboureur à sa charrue le charretier parmi la rue et l'artisan en sa boutique avec un psaume ou cantique en son labeur se soulager heureux qui aura le berger et la bergère en bois estant faire que rocher et estant après eux chantent la hauteur du saint nom de leur créateur commencez dame commencez le siècle doré avancez en chantant d'un cœur débonnaire de dans ce saint cancionnaire thrice happy day who shall behold and listen in that age of gold as by the plough the labourer strays and carmen mid the public ways and tradesmen in his shop shall swell their voice in psalm or canticle sing to solace toil again from woods shall come a sweeter strain shepherd and shepherdess shall vie in many a tender psalmody and the creator's name prolong as rock and stream return their song begin then ladies fair begin the age renewed that knows no sin and with light heart that wants no wing sing from this holy songbook sing footnote in the curious tract already referred to the following quotation is remarkable the scene the fancy of marot pictured to him had anciently occurred saint jerome in his seventeenth epistle to marcellus thus describes it in christian villages little else is to be heard but psalms for which way soever you turn yourself either you have the ploughman at his plough singing hallelujahs the weary brewer refreshing himself with a psalm or the vine dresser chanting forth somewhat of david's End of footnote. this holy song-book for the harpsichord or the voice was a gay novelty and no book was ever more eagerly received by all classes than marot's psalms in the fervour of that day they sold faster than the printers could take them off their presses but as they were understood to be songs and yet were not accompanied by music every one set them to favourite tunes commonly those of popular ballads each of the royal family and every nobleman chose a psalm or a song which expressed his own personal feelings adapted to his own tune the dauphin afterwards henry the second a great hunter when he went to the chase was singing ainsi qu'on vit le cerf bruire like as the heart desires the water brooks there is a curious portrait of the mistress of henry the famous diane de poitiers recently published on which is inscribed this verse of the psalm on a portrait which exhibits diane in an attitude rather unsuitable to so solemn an application no reason could be found to account for this discordance perhaps the painter or the lady herself chose to adopt the favourite psalm of her royal lover proudly to designate the object of her love besides its double allusion to her name diane however in the first stage of their mutual attachment took du fond de ma pensée or from the depth of my heart 
the queen's favorite was ne veuille pas au sire me reprendre en ton ire that is rebuke me not in thy indignation which she sung to a fashionable jig antony king of navarre sung revenge moi prends la querelle or stand up o lord to revenge my quarrel to the air of a dance of poitou we may conceive the ardour with which this novelty was received for francis sent to charles v marot's collection who both by promises and presents encouraged the french bard to proceed with his version and entreating marot to send him as soon as possible confetimini domino quoniam bonus because it was his favourite psalm and the spanish as well as french composers hastened to set the psalms of marot to music the fashion lasted for henry the second set one to an air of his own composing catherine de medici had her psalm and it seems that every one at court adopted some particular psalm for themselves which they often played on lutes and guitars etc singing psalms in verse was then one of the chief ingredients in the happiness of social life the universal reception of marot's psalms induced theodore beza to conclude the collection and ten thousand copies were immediately dispersed but these had the advantage of being set to music for we are told they were admirably fitted to the violin and other musical instruments and who was the man who had thus adroitly taken hold of the public feeling to give it this strong direction it was the solitary thaumaturgus the ascetic calvin who from the depth of his closet at geneva had engaged the finest musical composers who were no doubt warmed by the zeal of propagating his faith to form these simple and beautiful airs to assist the psalm singers at first this was not discovered and catholics as well as huguenots were solacing themselves on all occasions with this new music but when calvin appointed these psalms as set to music to be sung at his meetings and marot's formed an appendix to the catechism of geneva this put an end to all psalm singing for the poor catholics marot himself was forced to fly to geneva from the formulations of the sorbonne and psalm singing became an open declaration of what the french called lutheranisme when it became with the reformed a regular part of their religious discipline the cardinal of lorraine succeeded in persuading the lovely patroness of the holy songbook diane de poitiers who at first was a psalm singer and a heretical reader of the bible to discountenance this new fashion he began by finding fault with the psalms of david and revived the amatory elegances of horace at that moment even the reading of the bible was symptomatic of lutheranism diane who had given way to these novelties would have a french bible because the queen catherine de medici had one and the cardinal finding a bible on her table immediately crossed himself beat his breast and otherwise so well acted his part that having thrown the bible down and condemned it he remonstrated with the fair penitent that it was a kind of reading not adapted for her sex containing dangerous matters if she was uneasy in her mind she should hear two masses instead of one and rest contented with her paternosters and her primer which were not only devotional but ornamented with a variety of elegant forms from the most exquisite pencils of france such is the story drawn from a curious letter written by a huguenot and a former friend of catherine de medici and by which we may infer that the reformed religion was making considerable progress in the french court had the cardinal of lorraine not interfered by persuading the mistress and she the king and the king his queen at once to give up psalm singing and reading the bible this infectious frenzy of psalm singing as wharton describes it under the calvinistic preachers had rapidly propagated itself through germany as well as france it was admirably calculated to kindle the flame of fanaticism and frequently served as the trumpet to rebellion these energetic hymns of geneva excited and supported a variety of popular insurrections in the most flourishing cities of the low countries and what our poetical antiquary could never forgive fomented the fury which defaced many of the most beautiful and venerable churches of flanders at length it reached our island at that critical moment when it had first embraced the reformation and here its domestic history was parallel with its foreign except perhaps in the splendour of its success sternhold an enthusiast for the reformation was much offended says wharton at the lascivious ballads which prevailed among the courtiers and with a laudable design to check these indecencies he undertook to be our marot without his genius thinking thereby 
says our cynical literary historian anthony wood that the courtiers would sing them instead of their sonnets but did not only some few accepted they were practised by the puritans in the reign of elizabeth for shakespeare notices the puritan of his day singing psalms to hornpipes footnote mr dowse imagined that this alludes to a common practice at that time among the puritans of burlesquing the plain chant of the papists by adapting vulgar and ludicrous music to psalms and pious compositions illustrations of shakespeare one three hundred and fifty five mr dowse does not recollect his authority my idea differs may we not conjecture that the intention was the same which induced sternhold to versify the psalms to be sung instead of lascivious ballads and the most popular tunes came afterwards to be adopted that the singer might practise his favourite one as we find it occurred in france and a footnote and more particularly during the protectorate of cromwell on the same plan of accommodating them to popular tunes and jigs which one of them said were too good for the devil psalms were now sang at lord mayor's dinners and city feasts soldiers sung them on their march and at parade and few houses which had windows fronting the streets but had their evening psalms for a story had come down to us to record that the hypocritical brotherhood did not always care to sing unless they were heard footnote ed phillips in his satire against hypocrites sixteen eighty nine alludes to this custom of the pious citizens singing with woeful noise like a cracked saint's bell jarring in the steeple tom sternhold's wretched prick song to the people now they're at home and have their suppers eat when thomas cries the master come repeat and if the windows gaze upon the street to sing a psalm they hold it very meet and a footnote end of section seventy five Section 76 of Curiosities of Literature, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Curiosities of Literature, Volume 2, by Isaac Disraeli. On the Ridiculous Titles Assumed by Italian Academies the italians are a fanciful people who have often mixed a grain or two of pleasantry and even of folly with their wisdom this fanciful character betrays itself in their architecture in their poetry in their extemporary comedy and in their improvisatory but an instance not yet accounted for of this national levity appears in those denominations of exquisite absurdity given by themselves to their academies i have in vain inquired for any assignable reason why the most ingenious men and grave and illustrious personages cardinals and princes as well as poets scholars and artists in every literary city should voluntarily choose to burlesque themselves and their serious occupations by affecting mysterious or ludicrous titles as if it were carnival time and they had to support masquerade characters and accepting such titles as we find in the cant style of our own vulgar clubs the society of odd fellows and of eccentrics a principle so whimsical but systematic must surely have originated in some circumstance not hitherto detected a literary friend recently in an italian city exhausted by the scirocco entered a house whose open door and circular seats appeared to offer to passengers a refreshing sorbetto he discovered however that he had got into the academy of the chameleons where they met to delight their brothers and any spirito gentle they could nail to a recitation an invitation to join the academicians alarmed him for with some impatient prejudice against these little creatures vocal with prose rhyme and usually with odes and sonnets begged for or purloined for the occasion he waived all further curiosity and courtesy and has returned home without any information how these chameleons looked when changing their colours in an academia such literary institutions prevalent in italy are the spurious remains of those numerous academies which simultaneously started up in that country about the sixteenth century 
they assumed the most ridiculous denominations and a great number is registered by quadrio and tiraboski whatever was their design one cannot fairly reproach them as mencken in his charlatanaria eruditorum seems to have thought for pompous quackery neither can we attribute to their modesty their choice of senseless titles for to have degraded their own exalted pursuits was but folly literary history affords no parallel to this national absurdity of the refined italians who could have suspected that the most eminent scholars and men of genius were associates of the oziosi the fantastici the insensati why should genoa boast of her sleepy yiterbo of her obstinate siena of her insipids her blockheads and her thunderstruck and naples of her furiosi while maserata exults in her madmen chained both quadrio and tiraboschi cannot deny that these fantastical titles have occasioned these italian academies to appear very ridiculous to the ultramontani but these valuable historians are no philosophical thinkers they apologize for this bad taste by describing the ardour which was kindled throughout italy at the restoration of letters and the fine arts so that every one and even every man of genius were eager to enrol their names in these academies and prided themselves in bearing their emblems that is the distinctive arms each academy had chosen but why did they mystify themselves folly once become national is a vigorous plant which sheds abundant seed the consequence of having adopted ridiculous titles for these academies suggested to them many other characteristic fopperies at florence every brother of the umidi assumed the name of something aquatic or inequality pertaining to humidity one was called the frozen another the damp one was the pike another the swan and grassini the celebrated novelist is known better by the cognomen of la lasca the roach by which he whimsically designates himself among the humids i find among the insensati one man of learning taking the name of stordido insensato another tenembroso insensato the famous florentine academy of la crusca amidst their grave labours to sift and purify their language threw themselves headlong into this vortex of folly their title the academy of bran was a conceit to indicate their art of sifting but it required an italian prodigality of conceit to have induced these grave scholars to exhibit themselves in the burlesque scenery of a pantomimical academy for their furniture consists of a mill and a bakehouse a pulpit for the orator is a hopper while the learned director sits on a millstone the other seats have the forms of a miller's dossers or great panniers and the backs consist of the long shovels used in ovens the table is a baker's kneading trough and the academician who reads has half his body thrust out of a great bolting sack with i know not what else for their inkstands and portfolios but the most celebrated of these academies is that degli arcadi at rome who are still carrying on their pretensions much higher whoever aspires to be aggregated to these arcadian shepherds receives a personal name and a title but not the deeds of a farm picked out of a map of the ancient arcadia or its environs for arcadia itself soon became too small a possession for these partitioners of moonshine their laws modelled by the twelve tables of the ancient romans their language in the venerable majesty of their renowned ancestors and this erudite democracy dating by the grecian olympiads which crescembini their first custod or guardian most painfully adjusted to the vulgar era were designed that the sacred erudition of antiquity might for ever be present among these shepherds footnote crescembini at the close of la bellezza della vulgar poesia roma seventeen hundred end of footnote 
galdoni in his memoirs has given an amusing account of these honours he says he was presented with two diplomas the one was my charter of aggregation to the arcadi of rome under the name of polisseno the other gave me the investiture of the flagrean fields i was on this saluted by the whole assembly in chorus under the name of polisseno flagreo and embraced by them as a fellow-shepherd and brother the arcadians are very rich as you may perceive my dear reader we possess estates in greece we watered them with our labours for the sake of reaping laurels and the turks sow them with grain and plant them with vines and laugh at both our titles and our songs when fontenelle became an arcadian they baptized the new pastor by their graceful diminutive fontenella allusive to the charm of his style and further they magnificently presented him with the entire isle of delos the late joseph walker an enthusiast for italian literature dedicated his memoir on italian tragedy to the countess spencer not inscribing it with his christian but his heathen name and the title of his arcadian estate ubanti tirinzio plain joseph walker in his masquerade dress with his arcadian signet of pan's reeds dangling in his title page was performing a character to which however well adapted not being understood he got stared at for his affectation we have lately heard of some licentious revellings of these arcadians in receiving a man of genius from our own country who himself composing italian rhyme had conceit enough to become a shepherd footnote history of the middle ages two five hundred and eighty four see also mr rose's letters from the north of italy volume one two hundred and four mr hallam has observed that such an institution as the society degli arcadi could at no time have endured public ridicule in england for a fortnight End of footnote. yet let us inquire before we criticise even this ridiculous society of the arcadians became a memorable literary institution and tiraboski has shown how it successfully arrested the bad taste which was then prevailing throughout italy recalling its muses to pure sources while the lives of many of its shepherds have furnished an interesting volume of literary history under the title of the illustrious arcadians crescembini and its founders had formed the most elevated conceptions of the society at its origin but poetical vaticinators are prophets only while we read their verses we must not look for that dry matter of fact the event predicted il vostro semi eterno occupera la terra ed i confini d'arcadia altra passando di non più visti gloriosi germi l'orio fecondera lito del conge e de simerari l'encofacandi arini mr mathias has recently with warmth defended the original arcadia and the assumed character of its members which has been condemned as betraying their affectation he attributes to their modesty before the critics of the arcadia the pastori as they modestly styled themselves with crescembini for their conductor and with the adorato albano for their patron clement the eleventh all that was depraved in language and in sentiment fled and disappeared the strange taste for giving fantastical denominations to literary institutions grew into a custom though probably no one knew how the founders were always persons of rank or learning yet still accident or caprice created the mystifying title and invented those appropriate emblems which still added to the folly the arcadian society derived its title from a spontaneous conceit this assembly first held its meetings on summer evenings in a meadow on the banks of the tiber for the fine climate of italy promotes such assemblies in the open air in the recital of an eclogue an enthusiast amidst all he was hearing and all he was seeing exclaimed i seem at this moment to be in the arcadia of ancient greece listening to the pure and simple strains of its shepherds 
enthusiasm is contagious amidst susceptible italians and this name by inspiration and by acclamation was conferred on the society even more recently at florence the academia called the columbaria or the pigeon-house proves with what levity the italians name a literary society the founder was the cavallero pazzi a gentleman who like morose abhorring noise chose for his study a garret in his palazzo it was indeed one of the old turrets which had not yet fallen in there he fixed his library and there he assembled the most ingenious florentines to discuss obscure points and to reveal their own contributions in this secret retreat of silence and philosophy to get to this cabinet it was necessary to climb a very steep and very narrow staircase which occasioned some facetious wit to observe that these literati were so many pigeons who flew every evening to their dovecote the cavallero pazzi to indulge this humour invited them to a dinner entirely composed of their little brothers in all the varieties of cookery the members after a hearty laugh assumed the title of the columbaria invented a device consisting of the top of a turret with several pigeons flying about it bearing an epigraph from dante quanto veder si puo by which they expressed their design not to apply themselves to any single object such facts sufficiently prove that some of the absurd or facetious denominations of these literary societies originated in accidental circumstances or in mere pleasantry but this will not account for the origin of those mystifying titles we have noticed for when grave men call themselves dolts or lunatics unless they are really so they must have some reason for laughing at themselves to attempt to develop this curious but obscure singularity in literary history we must go further back among the first beginnings of these institutions how were they looked on by the governments in which they first appeared these academies might perhaps form a chapter in the history of secret societies one not yet written but of which many curious materials lie scattered in history it is certain that such literary societies in their first origins have always excited the jealousy of governments but more particularly in ecclesiastical rome and the rival principalities of italy if two great nations like those of england and france had their suspicions and fears roused by a select assembly of philosophical men and either put them down by force or closely watched them this will not seem extraordinary in little despotic states we have accounts of some philosophical associations at home which were joined by sir philip sidney and sir walter raleigh but which soon got the odium of atheism attached to them and the establishment of the french academy occasioned some umbrage for a year elapsed before the parliament of paris would register their patent which was at length accorded by the political richelieu observing to the president that he should like the members according as the members liked him thus we have ascertained one principle that governments in those times looked on a new society with a political glance nor is it improbable that some of them combined an ostensible with a latent motive there is no want of evidence to prove that the modern romans from the thirteenth to the fifteenth century were too feelingly alive to their obscured glory and that they too frequently made invidious comparisons of their ancient republic with the pontifical government to revive rome with everything roman inspired such enthusiasts as rienzi and charmed the visions of petrarch at a period when ancient literature as if by a miracle was raising itself from its grave the learned were agitated by a correspondent energy not only was an estate sold to purchase a manuscript but the relic of genius was touched with a religious emotion the classical purity of cicero was contrasted with the barbarous idiom of the missal the glories of ancient rome with the miserable subjugation of its modern pontiffs and the metaphysical reveries of plato and what they term the enthusiasmus alexandrinus the dreams of the platonists seemed to the fanciful italians more elevated than the humble and pure ethics of the gospels 
the vain and amorous eloisa could even censure the gross manners as it seemed to her of the apostles for picking the ears of corn in their walks and at their meals eating with unwashed hands touched by this mania of antiquity the learned affected to change their vulgar christian name by assuming the more classical ones of a junius brutus a pomponius or a julius or any other rusty name unwashed by baptism this frenzy for the ancient republic not only menaced the pontificate but their platonic or their pagan ardours seem to be striking at the foundation of christianity itself such were marcellus ficinus and that learned society who assembled under the medici pomponius latus who lived at the close of the fifteenth century not only celebrated by an annual festival the foundation of rome and raised altars to romulus but openly expressed his contempt for the christian religion which this visionary declared was only fit for barbarians but this extravagance and irreligion observes niceron were common with many of the learned of those times and this very pomponius was at length formally accused of the crime of changing the baptismal names of the young persons whom he taught for pagan ones this was the taste of the times says the author we have just quoted but it was imagined that there was a mystery concealed in these changes of names at this period these literary societies first appear one at rome had the title of academy and for its chief this very pomponius for he is distinguished as romane princeps academiae by his friend politian in the messalinea of that elegant scholar this was under the pontificate of paul the second the regular meetings of the academy soon excited the jealousy and suspicions of paul and gave rise to one of the most horrid persecutions and scenes of torture even to death in which these academicians were involved this closed with a decree of paul's that for the future no one should pronounce either seriously or in jest the very name of academy under the penalty of heresy the story is told by platina one of the sufferers in his life of paul the second and although this history may be said to bear the bruises of the wounded and dislocated body of the unhappy historian the facts are unquestionable and connected with our subject platina pomponius and many of their friends were suddenly dragged to prison on the first and second day torture was applied and many expired under the hands of their executioners you would have imagined says platina that the castle of st angelo was turned into the bull of phalaris so loud the hollow vault resounded with the cries of those miserable young men who were an honour to their age for genius and learning the torturers not satisfied though weary having racked twenty men in these two days of whom some died at length sent for me to take my turn the instruments of torture were ready i was stripped and the executioners put themselves to their work bionysius sat like another minos on a seat of tapestry work gay as at a wedding and while i hung on the rack in torment he played with a jewel which sanga had asking him who was the mistress which had given him this love token turning to me he asked why pomponio in a letter should call me holy father did the conspirators agree to make you pope pomponio i replied can best tell why he gave me this title for i know not at length having pleased but not satisfied himself with my tortures he ordered me to be let down that i might undergo tortures much greater in the evening i was carried half dead into my chamber but not long after the inquisitor having dined and being fresh in drink i was fetched again and the archbishop of spilatro was there they inquired of my conversations with malatesta i said it only concerned ancient and modern learning the military arts and the characters of illustrious men the ordinary subjects of conversation 
i was bitterly threatened by vianesius unless i confessed the truth on the following day and was carried back to my chamber where i was seized with such extreme pain that i had rather have died than endured the agony of my battered and dislocated limbs but now those who were accused of heresy were charged with plotting treason pomponius being examined why he changed the names of his friends he answered boldly that this was no concern of his judges or the pope it was perhaps out of respect for antiquity to stimulate to a virtuous emulation after we had now lain ten months in prison paul comes himself to the castle where he charged us among other things that we had disputed concerning the immortality of the soul and that we held the opinion of plato by disputing you call the being of a god in question this i said might be objected to all divines and philosophers who to make the truth appear frequently question the existence of souls and of god and of all separate intelligences st austin says the opinion of plato is like the faith of christians i followed none of the numerous heretical factions paul then accused us of being two great admirers of pagan antiquities yet none were more fond of them than himself for he collected all the statues and sarcophagi of the ancients to place in his palace and even affected to imitate on more than one occasion the pomp and charm of their public ceremonies while they were arguing mention happened to be made of the academy when the cardinal of san marco cried out that we were not academics but a scandal to the name and paul now declared that he would not have that term ever more mentioned under pain of heresy he left us in a passion and kept us two months longer in prison to complete the year as it seems he had sworn such is the interesting narrative of platina from which we may surely infer that if these learned men assembled for the communication of their studies inquiries suggested by the monuments of antiquity the two learned languages ancient authors and speculative points of philosophy these objects were associated with others which terrified the jealousy of modern rome some time after at naples appeared the two brothers john baptiste and john vincent porta those twin spirits the castor and pollux of the natural philosophy of that age and whose scenical museum delighted and awed by its optical illusions its treasure of curiosities and its natural magic all learned natives and foreigners their names are still famous and their treatises de humana physiognomia and magia naturalis are still opened by the curious who discover these children of philosophy wandering in the arcana of nature to them a world of perpetual beginnings these learned brothers united with the marquis of manso the friend of tasso in establishing an academy under the whimsical name degli oziosi the lazy which so ill described their intentions this academy did not sufficiently embrace the views of the learned brothers and then they formed another under their own roof which they appropriately named degli secreti the ostensible motive was that no one should be admitted into this interior society who had not signalized himself by some experiment or discovery it is clear that whatever they intended by the project the election of the members was to pass through the most rigid scrutiny and what was the consequence the court of rome again started up with all its fears and secretly obtaining information of some discussions which had passed in this academy degli secreti prohibited the portas from holding such assemblies or applying themselves to those illicit sciences whose amusements are criminal and turn us aside from the study of the holy scriptures it seems that one of the portas had delivered himself in the style of an ancient oracle but what was more alarming in this prophetical spirit several of his predictions have been actually verified the infallible court was in no want of a new school of prophecy baptiste de porta went to rome to justify himself and content to wear his head placed his tongue in the custody of his holiness and no doubt preferred being a member of the academia degli oziosi to that degli secreti to confirm this notion that these academies excited the jealousy of those despotic states of italy 
i find that several of them at florence as well as at siena were considered as dangerous meetings and in fifteen sixty eight the medici suddenly suppressed those of the insipids the shy the disheartened and others but more particularly the stunned gli entronati which excited loud laments we have also an account of an academy which calls itself the lanternists from the circumstance that their first meetings were held at night the academicians not carrying torches but only lanterns this academy indeed was at toulouse but evidently formed on the model of its neighbours in fine it cannot be denied that these literary societies or academies were frequently objects of alarm to the little governments of italy and were often interrupted by political persecution from all these facts i am inclined to draw an inference it is remarkable that the first italian academies were only distinguished by the simple name of their founders one was called the academy of pomponius latus another of panormita etc it was after the melancholy fate of the roman academy of latus which could not however extinguish that growing desire of creating literary societies in the italian cities from which the members derived both honour and pleasure that suddenly we discover these academies bearing the most fantastical titles i have not found any writer who has attempted to solve this extraordinary appearance in literary history and the difficulty seems great because however frivolous or fantastical the titles they assumed their members were illustrious for rank and genius Terabaski, aware of this difficulty can only express his astonishment at the absurdity and his vexation at the ridicule to which the italians have been exposed by the coarse jokes of mencinius in his charlatanaria eruditorum footnote c tiraboski volume seven chapter four academy and quadrios della storia e della ragione d'ogni poesia in the immense receptacle of these seven quarter volumes printed with a small type the curious may consult the voluminous index art academia End of footnote i conjecture that the invention of these ridiculous titles for literary societies was an attempt to throw a sportive veil over meetings which had alarmed the papal and the other petty courts of italy and to quiet their fears and turn aside their political wrath they implied the innocence of their pursuits by the jocularity with which the members treated themselves and were willing that others should treat them this otherwise inexplicable national levity of so refined a people has not occurred in any other country because the necessity did not exist anywhere but in italy in france in spain and in england the title of the ancient academus was never profaned by an adjunct which systematically degraded and ridiculed its venerable character and its illustrious members long after this article was finished i had an opportunity of consulting an eminent italian whose name is already celebrated in our country il signor ugo foscolo footnote ugo foscolo was born in padua where he achieved an early success as an author he entered the italian army in eighteen o five but soon quitted it and became professor of literature in the university of pavia but his lectures alarmed napoleon by their boldness of speech and he suppressed the professorship he came to england in eighteen fifteen and was exceedingly well received he wrote much in the edinburgh and quarterly reviews besides publishing several books he died in eighteen twenty seven and is buried at chiswick End of footnote. his decision ought necessarily to outweigh mine but although it is incumbent on me to put the reader in possession of the opinion of a native of his high acquirements it is not as easy for me on this obscure and curious subject to relinquish my own conjecture il signor foscolo is of opinion that the origin of the fantastical titles assumed by the italian academies entirely arose from a desire of getting rid of the air of pedantry and to insinuate that their meetings and their works were to be considered merely as sportive relaxations and an idle business this opinion may satisfy an italian and this he may deem a sufficient apology for such absurdity but when scarlet robes and cowled heads laureated bards and monseigneurs and cavalleros baptize themselves in a public assembly blockheads or madmen 
we ultramontanes out of mere compliment to such great and learned men would suppose that they had their good reasons and that in this there must have been something more than meets the ear after all i would almost flatter myself that our two opinions are not so wide of each other as they at first seem to be end of section seventy six